Hello again. Walter Rauschenbusch, page 87 of Christianity and the Social Crisis. Now he's dealing with give to Caesar what is Caesar's. The text, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, seems to mark off a definite sphere of power for the emperor, coordinate with God's sphere. It implies passive obedience to constituted authority, and above all guarantees Caesar's right to levy taxes. Consequently, it has been very dear to all who are anxious to secure the sanctions of religion for the existing political order. During the Middle Ages, that text was one of the spiritual pillars that supported the Holy Roman Empire. But in fact, we misread it if we take it as a solemn decision fixing two coordinate spheres of life, the religious and the political. His opponents were trying to corner Jesus. If he said, pay the Roman tax, he disgusted the people. If he said, do not pay, Rome would seize him, for its patience was short when its taxes were touched. Jesus wittily cut the Gordian knot by calling for one of the coins. It bore the hated Roman face and stamp on it, clear evidence when it, whence it issued and to whom it belonged. If they filled their pockets with Caesar's money, let them pay Caesar's tax. The significant fact to us is that Jesus spoke from an inward plane which rose superior to the entire question. It was a vital question for Jewish religion. It did not even touch the religion of Jesus. Moreover, it was not purely a religious question with them. Matters that concern money somehow never are purely religious. In paying tribute to Caesar, they seemed to deny the sovereignty of Jehovah, Israel's only king. That was indeed one point for grief. But another point was that they had to pay, pay, pay. And money is such a dear thing. Jesus felt none of their fond reverence for cash. Hence he could say, give to Caesar the stuff that belongs to him, and give to God what he claims. We have another incident in which his inward attitude to taxation comes out. The Jews annually paid a poll tax of half a shekel for the support of the temple worship, which sufficed to maintain it in splendor. The collector met Peter and asked if his master did not intend to pay. Peter, probably knowing his custom hitherto, said, Certainly. When he came into the house, Jesus, who seems to have overheard the conversation, asked him from whom the kings of the earth usually exacted taxes, from their subjects or their sons. Peter rightly judged that the subjects usually did the paying, and the members of the royal family were exempt. Then, said Jesus, as we are sons of God and princes of the blood royal, we are exempt from God's temple tax, but lest we give offense, go catch a fish and pay the tax. We all know by experience that the expression of the face and eye are often quite essential for understanding the spirit of a conversation. We must think of Jesus with a smile on his lips during this conversation with his friend Peter. Yet something of his most fundamental attitude to existing institutions found expression in this gentle raillery. He was inwardly free. He paid because he wanted to, and not because he had to. Camille Desmoulins, one of the spiritual leaders of the French Revolution, called Jesus le bon sens culotte, which apparently means one of the common people, a Parisian Republican, as it were, during the revolutionary period. Emile de Lavelier, Lavelli, the eminent Belgian economist who had the deepest reverence for Christianity as a social force, said, quote, if Christianity were taught and understood conformably to the spirit of its founder, the existing social organism could not last a day. And James Russell Lowell said, there is dynamite enough in the New Testament, if illegitimately applied, to blow all our existing institutions to atoms. These men have not seen amiss. Jesus was not a child of this world. He did not revere the men it called great. He did not accept its customs and social usages as final. His moral conceptions did not run along the grooves marked out by it. He nourished within his soul the ideal of a common life so radically different from the present that it involved a reversal of values, a revolutionary displacement of existing relations. 
This ideal was not merely a beautiful dream to solace his soul. He lived it out in his own daily life. He urged others to live that way. He held that it was the only true life and that the ordinary way was misery and folly. He dared to believe that it would triumph when he saw that the people were turning from him and that his nation had chosen the evil way and was drifting toward the rocks that would destroy it, unutterable sadness filled his soul. But he never abandoned his faith in the final triumph of that kingdom of God for which he had lived. For the present, the cross, but beyond the cross, the kingdom of God. If he was not to achieve it now, he would return and do it then. I wanted to link to a, a video we shot on the Watchtower's misuse of this Caesar text. And next time Rauschenbusch summarizes the social aims of Jesus.